Good morning, church. Our lesson today is entitled A Plan Unfolding. I want you to know that this is the first lesson who, which will bring us to the birth of Christ at the end of the month. I have um, taken a lot of liberty in this lesson to begin with, and I want you to know I have, but I have tried to put things and thoughts together that I think will bring us to a plan. And I've entitled this A Plan Unfolding. And what I want you to do is, in this opening comments that I'm about to make, I want you to tie into it with your emotions. I want you to strive to feel what I'm trying to pull out. Because if you don't feel it, this lesson's not going to mean much to you. So I want you to grab a hold. It must have been devastating to Adam and Eve. They did one little thing wrong. And God said, you're out of here. Things will never be the same again. Not for you. And life as they knew it was gone. God had provided for them. God had taken care of them. They had no worries. They had no pains. There was no sickness. There was no sorrow. There was nothing but now. That life is gone. Their fellowship with God was gone. I look at the world and I see the darkness that's in it in places where there is no God. And the only hope for this world is in the lives of those who are gods and who carry Him with them. Fellowship gone. They could not eat of the tree of life anymore. And eternity, eternal life that is, was gone. But here's the big piece. All of that had happened to them and there was nothing that they could do about it. They were totally Helpless. And they were put out of the garden. God withdrew. And nothing they could do about it. Now I want to give you a little hope here. The plan that is Christ to come. It was in the making, but I don't know that they realized it. Now, I want you to think about God has in mind Jesus, and they are devastated with no hope, and he's not telling them anything much. No hope. Now, I want you to translate that feeling into the world today. In Romans chapter 8, it says the whole uh, uh, world is groaning for delivery. I don't think that means the ground. I think that means Jew, Gentile, lost. And we don't know what we're lacking. We, don't ha we have a space that God put in us for him to be in our heart and if he's not there, that is an empty, hollow feeling. Christ is coming. How soon did it start? In June, I spent some time telling you it was before the world began. In August, I had one lesson where I again put that in that it was before the world began 
I'm using the same thing, a different passage this morning. It comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Before there was a grain of sand built. Before there was space and air. Before the first human breath was drawn, God determined that he was going to allow us to be saved from our own sins. Let's see what else he says. That we should be holy without blame before him in love. I had Romans chapter 4 as my lesson down at Springville this morning, the first eight verses. Paul sets that chapter up as saying, you've sinned, and you need something. In the last part of chapter 3, he says, but God, willing to show his righteousness, sent Jesus to be the propitiation or the sacrifice, the covering for our sins. Why? So we could be holy and without blame in his sight. He goes on. Having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now I can tell you a little secret. On one hand, I believe in predestination. <laughs> On the other hand, I believe in Bible predestination and not what most people say is predestination. Bible predestination is found in this passage. Before the world began, Jesus was chosen to come to earth to sacrifice for my sins. The good news, the premise of Romans, the good news in him, the premise of the book of Ephesians, for this passage, all nations should be blessed. And so, from the first Thessalonians, God calls us by that gospel, that good news. The Revelation letter closes with, whosoever will, let him come and take of the waters of life freely. Every single person in the universe has an opportunity to come to God through the gospel. And when they do, they have answered and put themselves in the position where they are counted as holy and righteous and without blame before Him in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the passage there. And it started before the world began. And the plan unfolds. A covenant was made. And you're thinking the covenant made to Abraham. No, that's, that's too late. The covenant was made. A covenant is an agreement between two. But there's one special problem with this covenant. God made the covenant and the receiver of the covenant had no choice in it. It's found in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. It's in the garden. Where God talked to Satan and he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel." Three things. God is telling Satan, you ain't got the last say in this. God says, I do. 
Satan has no choice but to agree with that. The second thing God says is that her seed, that's important. I think I'm going to present for my Christmas lesson about the virgin birth and how important it is in your faith. Her seed, not man's seed. It was not Adam's seed. It was her. It was God who impregnated Mary. Not Adam. That is extremely important to your faith. And when that seed comes, it will be his seed. You see that? And between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So what was going to come from Mary's seed was a male. Right off the bat. The covenant was made. This is what God was going to do. To bring the descendants of Adam and Eve who were lost in sin back to himself. We got to go on. The plan unfolds more. There's a first recorded sacrifice. It is found in Genesis chapter 4 verses 1 through 13. And it's the account where Cain slew Abel. Because of the sacrifice. Cain's sacrifice was not acceptable. But Abel's was. And so Cain got mad at Abel. And killed him. I saw on Facebook. He used a rock. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say. He used a rock. It could have been a, a piece of wood. He jabbed through his stomach. It could have been. He strangled him. It could have been. He hit him over the head with his fist several times. I don't know what it was. The Bible says Cain slew Abel. And God says sin lies at the door. Because he had done wrong first of all in the sacrifice. Then he did wrong also in the murder. I don't know what the, the sacrifice is wrong. Some people say, well, it's because it was not a blood sacrifice. That could be. But at that time, there was no command for any sacrifice recorded. He did it, so I'm assuming God told him. Was it that it wasn't blood? It might have been. Was it because it wasn't the best uh, of, of uh, his fruits? It could have been because he offered the fruits of the field. We don't know. But it wasn't what God wanted or it wasn't given in the way God wanted it given or it wasn't given with the heart that God wanted him to offer it with. I don't know. But there was something wrong. If you do right, you'll be acceptable. But if you do wrong, you won't be acceptable. Is that not the same way it is today? Yes, it is. So Cain punished, was punished by the Lord. I want you to see this. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be restless wanderer in the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And we read over that and we go on. Do you understand that when you and I sin, it drives us from the presence of the Lord, and it should hurt us? And our response to God should be, my punishment is 
greater than I can bear and I need relief. God, I'm sorry. Because the devastation that Adam and Eve felt is transferred onto us because of the things that we do and we disappoint God and we go away from God. God, keep us near. Keep cleansing us. And that plan is just unfolded. I want you to keep coming back to me. Don't leave me. We go now to Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. So I know that God is going to send his son through Mary. And he's going to have to shed his blood for me. There's no way around it. To put that in plain sight so you can see it. This is why Christ had to die. He could not come and just be a king on earth. It was not a rejection of the Jews that caused him to die. It was because I have sinned. And it's because you have sinned. And I need to feel that. That's why he had to die. And that sacrifice had to be a man. Because it was by man that sin entered into the world. And it has to be by man. That sin is taken out of the world. But there's no man. That's pure enough. To be the sacrifice. So God had to come himself. Because that sacrifice had to be without blemish. The principle was set up by the law of Moses. Without blemish. And the plan unfolds. And we have God's voice comes through the ages. In the Bible, there are recorded over 40 prophets that all talked about Jesus, about his sacrifice, about what he did, what he means, and the effect of his being here. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Now look at this, because here it is, the Lord's sign. Here's the sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And if you have a Bible that changes the word virgin there to a young woman, you need to mark that out. It is true. The word virgin there can indeed mean a young woman. But here in Henry County, when I was a truancy officer, I dealt with a young girl. She was 12 years old that gave birth to a son. A young woman is not a sign from God. But a young woman who had not had sex and gives birth to a baby, that's a sign from God. And so Mary says in Luke chapter 1 verse 34, How can this be since I don't know a man? Put that in, in Henry County language. I can't have a child since I have not had sex. The sign from God was a woman who had not had sex. A virgin shall conceive without a man. Do you remember? Her seed shall bruise your head. That's why I'm thinking about that virgin birth as a lesson for Christmas 
being so important to us. And you shall call his name Emmanuel. That's not just a name that's popular then. That's not just a name that God chose out of thin air. It has two sides to it. One side is it means that God comes and dwells on the earth. God with you. The other side of that name is God saves his people. The name prophesied by Isaiah would mean God comes, he dwells on the earth, and he saves his people. And so, Matthew, you're going to call his name Emmanuel. No choice. And the plan unfolds a little bit more. And so after Jesus died, after he was resurrected, and just before his ascension, he says, all things are written in the law and the Psalms and the prophets concerning me must be fulfilled. And so as we look back at the prophecies, and we look at what happened to Jesus, it was the plan of God unfolding before us. The last prophet was John the Immerser. He comes. Now I didn't say John the Baptist here simply because there's a denomination and calls themselves Baptist. John was not a member of that denomination. It did not exist. So I'm using that Immerser. Because that's what he did. And that's what the, the term Baptist means. An immerser. He came proclaiming. Make straight the paths of the Lord. And we say well big deal. No it's, it is a big deal. Because you see that was the announcement. Of he's coming. The king is coming. When a king decided to go out to a certain place, he would send an entourage before him. They would pick up sticks and limbs, move trees out of the road, fill in potholes so the king's ride would be comfortable. They would clear the area of robbers and thieves so that it would be safe. And you know that happens. Our president says, I'm going to visit in Paris, Tennessee. A week before he comes, do you know what happens? There are some gray sedans that show up. Men in suits. And they walk the streets of Paris, cleaning it up. Not picking up trash. They come in and they clean out any rift raft that might cause the president a problem. It is making straight the paths we do that today. And when our president goes across the seas, do you think that might happen? Yes, it happens. Yes, it happens. And so John comes. He's the first cousin. No, it's not first cousin. He is a cousin of Jesus. And he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Here's the King. Here he is. And then John the Apostle writes, And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John says, I am an eyewitness of God coming, living in the flesh to save his people. And the plan just unfolds again. Hope regained. Remember Adam and Eve? They were devastated. And they really didn't have any hope. There was no hope with you can't eat of the tree of life any longer. There was no hope in 
I'm not going to be with you anymore. You're going to have to make your own clothes. You're going to have to get your own food. You're going to have to do for yourself. By the time Jesus comes, by the sweat of your brow. If a man won't work, neither shall he eat. No hope. How devastating. But you know what Paul wrote? You were dead in your sins and trespasses. No hope. You were separated from God and without hope. But the plan unfolds. The only thing that they could latch on to it worth anything was that her seeing would bruise his head. And the prophets came and they preached, but they never saw the promise. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10-11 through 11 says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Search in what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. They searched and they didn't see it. Adam and Eve lived a long time. They may have seen Methuselah and Methuselah may have seen Moses. Methuselah's the oldest man to ever live, they say. You're talking about three people, and Moses we know very well. And they lived all that time, and all they had to go on was her seed will bruise your head. And all the way down through Malachi, those prophets preached and they were mistreated and they were killed and all kinds of things happened to them and they never, ever saw Jesus. Peter's point is that they, they didn't see what you now have, what you experience and the hope that you have in Christ. So hope regained is not for them. But it's for me and it's for you. God is telling you it's not like it used to be. It's no longer being put out of the garden. But today you walk with God like Adam did. In the cool of the evening, a picture of rest. And you know the passage, I will never leave you. No more are you going to be put out of the garden. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 22, Paul says, the difference is this. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. How important is that to your faith? Do you remember what he said to Adam and Eve? In the day you eat of that tree, you shall die. And it's not recorded but I know what Satan did. God said you'd die, but look, you're still alive. And the death that they died on that day was separation from God. 
but physical death eventually came to them. And it's the same trick and story that Satan's telling now. The Bible says you're dead. But look, you're still breathing. You're still living. Everything's going on as normal. You know what Jesus said? He said, if you eat my blood, eat my body and drink my blood, you shall have life. You can't eat of the tree of fruit of knowledge, but if you eat of my body and drink of my blood, you shall have life. The Old Testament tells us the life is in the blood. For since man, by man came death, by man also came the resurrection. Because it was Adam which sinned and caused us to be separated from God, God sent himself so that we could have him back again and we could be raised with him. Raised to walk in the newness of life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So let's close this thing down. And let's kind of recap so that you can see the plan as it unfolds. It was before the world began that God did this plan. We don't know whether it was a short time or a long time. Do you know why we don't know what, whether it's a long time or short time before the world began? Because in eternity there is no time. It just happened. In the garden to Satan, he says, you're done for, buddy. Your head is bruised by the woman's seed. You tricked her? She's fixing to get you. And I say thank you Mary. And thank you all you ladies. Because without woman. There is no hope. In this world. The prophets came. And they prophesied about Jesus. And the last one says. He was one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. He's coming. Clean it all up. And in that mix of prophets, one said a virgin is going to conceive and bear a son. And Jesus came and he walked the face of this earth. And he said, you destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it up. Yeah. That's the plan of God. And Paul says, but now is Christ raised from the dead. And the plan is completed. God is trying to save my soul. And so in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39, I want you all to look up here. Here it is. I want you to read it along with me. For I am persuaded, are you persuaded? I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Satan says, you don't have to obey God. And that passage says, if I am persuaded, Satan, you don't have a chance. That passage says, if I am persuaded, there is nothing That'll get me away from God.
So the plan unfolded is this. Here it is in a nutshell. Our being in the love of God that's given to us in Jesus. Stay with him. And there's the plan.